Hello there. So today we're going to be looking at EM induction. Um, and the first thing we're going to look at um, is trying to get the idea of this law called Faraday's law. Uh, Faraday's law tells us how, uh, basically how a generator works. It talks about how changing magnetic fields uh, create electricity. So let's go into that. I'm going to derive the equation um, and then just see how we can use it. So what you should remember from your IGCSEs or GCSEs is that in order to generate electricity, what we need to do is move a magnet near a wire. Um, hopefully you can remember that if I was to just hold a magnet here and not move it, I'm not going to get any uh, voltage generated. Um, Similarly, if I don't have a wire or I don't have a magnet, I'm not going to get voltage anyway, either. So, so the three things I need are movement, a magnetic field, and I need a coil or a wire. If I have those three things, usually I can generate electricity. So what we're going to look at today is exactly how that works. Um, you might see this uh, sometimes in another type of uh, generator. So this type of generator is usually known as a dynamo. Um, so there are usually two different types of generators that you can use. In the dynamo, um, the magnet moves and you get an alternating current coming out. Now, the other type of generator that we often see are where you have a coil of wire that you spin in a stationary magnetic field. So as you've uh, probably seen before, this is going to give us AC and uh, sorry AC as opposed to DC. So direct current DC. That's the type of uh, current that you get out of a battery. And if you can remember back to your IGCSE, if you remember some of the stuff we did in electronics about uh, how diodes work, um, that's current that does not change direction. So the voltage is always a constant level. With uh, the thing we're going to look at today. These give you alternating currents. So those are currents where the voltage is going positive, negative, positive, negative, um, and the current therefore also changes direction. So as we've said, what we need in order to induce a current are a wire, which has electrons in it, we need a magnet, and we need movement. So if we think about this in terms of fields, we can say, well, what's actually changing? What's changing is that magnetic field. So what we can say is that we need electrons to experience a changing magnetic field. And what we're going to now do is prove why that is. So if you think back to what we did previously about uh, uh, particles in uh, magnetic fields, charged particles, um, you should be able to remember that if I use Fleming's left hand rule, uh, so this is my left hand. I'm not sure I was going to mirror on the screen, so sorry if it looks the other way around. Um, I've got an electron here. So if you remember, current is always the direction of a positively charged particle. So in this case, my current is actually running backwards. So what we need to do um, is with your second finger, which is the current, that needs to point back towards the left. Um, the field is going into the page, and you can see, therefore, the force acts down on this electron, pushing it downwards uh, through my page. Now, that makes a lot of sense, but let's take it one step further. Let's enclose these electrons in a conducting rod, in other words, in a wire. So if I have electrons in a wire, well, obviously I know that those electrons are all going to be moved downwards as well. But now what I can say is that this V direction, um, you often use this as a direction of force. So your thumb. And now I can say, well, my electrons are going that way. So if they're in a wire, I actually have a current that's going up the page. And this gives us, or is how we prove, Fleming's right-hand rule. So you might have used this um, at IGCSE. Um, we often say 
generators. So if you have a stationary magnetic field and you are pushing a conductor into that, then you can use the generator rule to work out the direction of that induced current. If you're dealing with a, uh, a field that is, uh, sorry, if you're dealing with a particle in a field or you're dealing with a motor, in a motor you're putting in uh, an electric current and you're getting out a false. So you can use your left hand rule. But this is just showing you why we have this difference. Why do we have the left hand rule? Why do we have the right hand rule? Um, it's because of those differences. So, what would happen if the induced current that we're creating um, caused a magnetic field that was in the same direction as the applied force? So what do I mean by that? Well, let's go all the way back to this diagram. What I can say is that I am going to be creating some kind of current in this coil of wire. Now, what happens when I have a current in a coil of wire? Well, what I get is uh, it, it starts to act like an electromagnet. So, let's say what would happen if, as I brought my magnet near, so I have a north pole there and a south pole there, what would happen if the current that I induced meant that I had a south pole here and a north pole here? Well, if you think about that, these north and south poles, they're going to mutually attract each other. So what would happen is, as I push my magnet towards this coil of wire, they're going to attract each other, so I'm actually going to feel more force, and my magnet's going to move faster. And if my magnet moves faster, what we know from experience already, is that I'm going to experience more current. So if I have even more current in my coil, I'm going to have a stronger magnetic field created, which is going to attract my magnet even more. Now that doesn't make sense to us as physicists because we know that you can't get energy from nothing. And if this magnet was attracting it as it went, then you'd be putting in a little bit of energy to start as you pushed it, but then you'd be getting electrical energy out from the, from the fact that it's generating electricity, and it would be generating more energy as it pulled it towards itself. And that doesn't make sense, because where on earth would that energy come from? So just by obeying the basic laws of physics, we can say, that when the magnet is here, it's actually going to have to, just by the laws of physics, repel. So this top part of the coil must be north, and the bottom part of the coil must be south. Now that's a really useful thing to know, because you can also then go ahead and use that with your right-hand grip rule to calculate the, the direction that the, uh, the field, sorry, that the current must be going in here. Remember, if you're using the right-hand grip rule with a coil of wire, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field, and your fingers point a uh, curve around in the direction of the current. So I can say in this case, as the magnet moves towards it, my current must be going that way. So we call this Lenz's law. This chap here is Lenz. And what he said is that the induced EMF will oppose the change that caused it. If you remember that as a general rule, it becomes very simple to solve quite a lot of problems. Um, and we can use this in the real world. If you look at, um, we often use this as a, as a type of break. So this is one of my favourite theme park rides, it's called Stealth at Thought Park. And the idea is that the car runs up here and then drops over and comes back down. But sometimes they make a mistake when they uh, calculate their amount of force to, sh to uh, put into it. So instead of doing that, sometimes you get it so that the car goes up to about here and then rolls back the way it came. Obviously that's going to be pretty bad because it's going to crash into the people that are at the, the bit where you get on the ride. So what you will see are just in front of the track, so the, the start is over here, um, you have these copper fins. And on the car itself, if this is the car, underneath it you have a very strong magnet. 
So it's going to have a magnetic field acting between them like this. Now what will happen is, if the car rolls back, the magnet will, f will kind of sweep between these copper plates. And what they induce in there are things called eddy currents. So because I've now got a magnetic field in a conductor and it's moving, it's going to create currents. But the cool thing is those currents that they create will create their own magnetic fields and those magnetic fields are going to oppose the car going between them. So what you end up with is a force pushing back against the car. Um, you might be wondering, well, how do they take off in the first place? Um, and very simply, these can drop up and down. So when the car is launched, they drop, they fire the car out, and as soon as the car's cleared it, they pop back up. So if the car does fall back down, um, the magnet will induce these eddy currents. Those eddy currents will oppose the magnet um, and will stop the car. Very, very cool, very simple way of doing this. So, we can uh, just a reminder, I said this earlier, but this is a diagram form of it. Solenoid rule is below. Um, if you have a coil of wire, then your thumb, your right, you always use your right hand, has to be your right hand. Um, and if you want to work out what direction a solenoid will produce a magnetic field, um, you use your fingers to point in the direction of the current and then your thumb will point north. So, let's think about what will happen if I drop a magnet into a coil of wire. So I'm gonna drop it south pole uh, first. So as it enters, Lenz's law tells us that we don't even we don't need to worry about any kind of working out what will happen to force of individual electrons. We can just say, whatever current is produced in this coil, it's going to create a magnetic field that opposes it dropping in. So the opposition of that will be if the top of the, the coil is south and the bottom is north, because that way it's going to, uh, the south poles will repel each other. So using your right hand grip rule, point your thumb downwards and you see that your fingers curl around in the way that's shown in this diagram. So you're going to get a current going round like that. When the coil's in the middle, you're actually not going to get any uh, field at all, and we'll talk about why that is later. But then when it leaves, well, when it leaves, those poles have to swap, because now the magnet's being withdrawn out of the bottom of the coil, and the coil wants to stop that. It doesn't necessarily want to oppose, it wants to oppose the change that's causing it. So how do you stop a magnet leaving? You attract it back. So to attract it back, whoops, I've done that the wrong way around, haven't I? Um, we're going to have to have a south pole here and a north pole there. And if you use your right hand grip rule again, now your fingers want to curl, so your, your thumb wants to be pointing up. And when your thumb points up, your, finger, your, your uh, fingers curl around like that. So what you notice is that as we drop something through a coil, the f direction of the voltage and the direction of the current change. And that starts to explain why we get alternating currents in these situations. Okay, so now I'm going to... Okay, so let's try and see if we can do some maths with this. Faraday's law tells us that for a current carrying wire, F is BIL. We're going to assume for all of these that uh, it's always at right angles. So you can remember it is actually BIL sine theta, but we'll assume for now that everything is always at right angles to the magnetic field. Now we also know a general equation, work done is force times distance. Remember that equation only works if force is constant, but we're going to be assuming for the sake of this that uh, magnetic field, current, and length are all constant. Um, so therefore, we can say that, that yes, uh, this equation works. Now, let's imagine that we're moving a conducting wire through a magnetic field. So here's my magnetic field, and I'm moving it through like this. My animation's not working, um, but so just imagine that it slices through um, and moves through like that. Now, we know that work done 
is force times distance. So if this distance is s, I know that the force is B I L. So work done is B I L S. But if you think about that, what I've got is now a rectangle with length L side S. So I can say L times S is the area of magnetic field that it passes through. So I get a new equation. I can say that the work done is magnetic flux, sorry, magnetic field strength times the current in my wire multiplied by the area that it moves through. Now, if you think back to, again, to IGCSE, actually, um, we know that induced, or we know that uh, voltage is work done per unit charge. So an EMF, remember an EMF is uh, uh, energy supplied uh, per coulomb. So that's going to be work done on the charge divided by the total amount of charge. So if I substitute that back into our previous equation, we can say that the EMF will be BIA over Q because I already worked out what uh, the work done was. I also know that the equation for charge is Q is I times T. So what I can say is if I substitute in for Q, I get BIA over I delta T. And then I can cancel out the I's and get this equation, BA over delta T. A couple of quick definitions for you, just to make sure you're clear with this. Um, the first one is the idea of magnetic flux density. So magnetic flux density, that is a property of a magnet. It tells us how powerful it is. So it's, you can think of it as the number of field lines uh, per square meter. So this is measured in Tesla which has a symbol capital T. Magnetic flux, that is how much magnetism is passing through an object, through an area. Um, so here I've got two magnets with identi identical flux densities, but because one has a larger area, the one with the larger area has a larger flux because it's got more field lines passing through it. Um, now, defi by definition, um, we can say that magnetic flux is given by the symbol uh, phi. This is a, a Greek letter phi. Um, and you write it as an I, capital I with a circle through the middle of it. Um, so that is B times A. And we give it the unit of the Weber. It's spelt Weber, but we pronounce it Weber, um, which is a capital W and a little b. Um, so we can say that one Weber is one tesla meter squared. Not tesla per meter squared, remember, it's just tesla meter squared because I'm doing something in tesla multiplied by something in meter squared. Um, and we always measure it perpendicular to the area. There's another one that we need um, because we might have more than one coil going through here. If you imagine that, if I've got a coil coming in, well, that's going to give me one set of area. And then if my coil goes round again, or again and again, every time I create a new coil, I'm adding an extra slice of area to that. So I can just multiply by the number of coils. So my last definition is magnetic flux linkage. That is n times phi or nba. So when I'm asked magnetic flux linkage, uh, magnetic flux linkage doesn't have a symbol by itself. Um, so we just give it the, we always write it as n phi because it means n lots of that magnetic flux. Now, as I said before, we're going to assume for most purposes that uh, this is always perpendicular to the coil. But if it's ever not perpendicular, um, you can just look at it like this and you can see straight away. Well, uh, just resolve your forces. This is theta, so I can say uh, flux linkage, magnetic flux linkage is NBA times the cosine of the angle uh, between the, the centre of the, uh, the coil and the uh, field lines. hope that makes sense to you. Okay, so let's try and put together two different things. So we've already worked out that uh, EMF must be NBA cos theta. Um, now, since we know that the flux linkage will be BA cos theta, that's what we found earlier, um, what I can say 
is that the induced EMF is equal to N d phi by dt. So we would write that as Faraday's law. And when we're writing Faraday's law, we can say an induced EMF is equal to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage. And that encapsulates most of what we already know about uh, magnetism. We know that if I spin a coil faster, it will generate a bigger EMF. We know that if I have a stronger magnetic field, I'll have a bigger EMF. The new thing we've also learned is if I just have a physically bigger coil, I will also get a bigger EMF. Um, and again, that should hopefully make something that's approaching sense to you guys, um, because if you think about just physically a bigger coil of wire, a bigger generator, it should make um, a bigger, uh, bigger EMF out of it. All right, so let's put these two equations together. Um, we usually write the law of magnetic induction as something like this. So Lenz's law, that gives us a minus sign in here. So that's indicating that the induced EMF opposes the change that caused it. So we stick a minus sign in there to show that the induced EMF will oppose things. Faraday's law tells us that uh, EMF is proportional to rate of change of flux linkage. Now you might be asked in the exam to explain those two areas, so make sure that you're feeling confident that you could say why this occurs. Now we're going to think about how we can apply what we know to AC generators. Um, so what you need to know for your exam is to be able to show the waveform for an AC generator. We might look at a few uh, common ideas as well. So what I want you to think about is a common generator like this. So we know that in a generator we have some magnetic field lines uh, and we've got a load of coils and we rotate those coils. So as we were rotating them, I've got a diagram here that is showing the magnetic flux through the coil over time. And hopefully what you can see is when the coil is side on to the magnetic field, there will be no field lines going through it. So effectively my area is zero. If we remember the full form of the equation, I can say induced EMF is equal to minus NBA uh, sine. Is it sine or cos? NBA cos sorry, cos theta over delta time. So when, uh, or let's just, uh, we, don't, we don't want EMF yet, do we? So let's just say uh, flux linkage. Flux linkage is NBA. Um, so at the start, the actual cross-sectional area that's going through these field, that these field lines are going through is zero. So when flux is zero. Then you can see as it goes side on, magnetic flux becomes maximum until it goes lower again. And if I then rotate it a little bit more, um, what we'll see is that will go negative. So I'm going to get a sinusoidal curve. Why does it go negative? Well, if you imagine that I flipped it upside down, when I flip it upside down, that's going to uh, that's going to uh, swap swap it over. So this gives us a really nice simple AC generator. Uh, the simplest AC generator we get is just a coil of wire between two magnets. And what we can see with that is we can say that the flux linkage is BAN cos theta. That's what we kind of did last lesson. Uh, now if you think about your circular, your, sorry, your uh, circular motion stuff, you could also then say that N phi is BAN cos 2 pi ft, but don't worry too much about that because this is more used on other examples. It doesn't come up so often uh, for CIE. What is useful though is to think about this. So I'm going to just extend this graph a little bit. So here we have um, at this point here, here, and here. So this kind of graph is something that does come up in the exam quite a lot. So what I want to do is think about magnetic flux linkage through my coil at each point. So at this point here, 
I can say that there is zero magnetic flux linkage through this coil. When my field is now a completely perpendicular to it, that's going to give me a big uh, f uh, field through it, and it goes back to zero again, and then becomes large again. So what we can see is we get something that varies sinusoidally like this. If you remember that EMF is minus NBA uh, over delta T, so it's the rate of change of flux linkage. So if you think about the tangents to these at any one time, this explains why. Right at this point I've just drawn a tangent to, the uh, gradient is zero, and that matches up with a zero on there. As we go over here, the gradient becomes larger. I've actually drawn this upside down, sorry about that. I'll, uh, I should have drawn this other way around. Um, so you get a larger gradient though. Just be aware of that because that's something that does come up in the exam.